Okay, hello. My name is uh, Dr. Victor Lachlan. I am a postdoctoral research fellow with the Research Foundation Flanders, FWO. I am currently based at the University of Antwerp here in Belgium, and more details about me can be found on my website, victorlachlan.com. So the title of my talk today is Radical Inactivism and Aspect Perception. So as I'm sure some people here are aware, inactivism covers a wide variety of views within both philosophy of cognitive science and cognitive science. For my purposes here, I'm going to distinguish between three distinct branches of inactivism. First, there is sensory motor inactivism. Uh, this form of inactivism attempts to dissolve the alleged explanatory gap between phenomenal experience and skilled bodily action. Second, there is autopoetic inactivism, sometimes just called mind life inactivism. This form of inactivism focuses on the biological origins of life uh, and then expands out to consider the wide range of sense making activities that organisms engage in when they engage with their environment. And finally, there is what is called radical inactivism. So, radical inactivism focuses on the role of representational content within our social and linguistic practices. In particular, how the role of such content is nowhere near as extensive as has been previously supposed. Now, nonetheless, despite this variety of inactivist approaches, I think it's fair to say that all inactivists share the following core principle. And this is that action and reaction form the basis for all human and animal mentality. Now, someone who also emphasized the central importance of action when it comes to understanding the mind was the Austrian philosopher Ludwig Wittgenstein. This emphasis is particularly evident in Wittgenstein's middle to later work. So examples of this are the following remarks. Wittgenstein wrote, the origin and the primitive forms of the language game is a reaction. Only from this can more complicated forms grow. Language is a refinement. In the beginning was the deed. He also wrote, the essence of the language game is a practical method, a way of acting, not speculation, not chatter. And finally, that the truths of logic are determined by a consensus of action, a consequence of doing the same thing, reacting in the same way. We all act in the same way, walk the same way, count the same way. So this emphasis on action and this link between Wittgenstein and activism has led to uh, a developing literature on this subject. So Daniel Hutto has remarked that there is a fundamental agreement between the inactive approach and Wittgenstein's later philosophy of psychology. And Daniel Moyle Sharrock goes so far as to regard Wittgenstein as, she puts it, the first inactivist. And this is, there has been a large uh, amount of literature uh, devoted to the subject, and there are the following authors. Now in my talk I'm going to develop this theme, uh, this link between Wittgenstein and activism, and I'm going to do it in the following way. So I'm going to use Wittgensteinian considerations in order to develop a radical inactive or wreck account of aspect perception. The central claim I will defend here is that seeing aspects is a non-contentful visual experience that is embedded within linguistic practices. So the structure of my talk is as follows. In the first part, I'm going to introduce radical inactivism or REC. In the second part, I'm going to discuss aspect perception or seeing aspects. And in the third and main part, I'm going to argue uh, that REC in fact mischaracterizes aspect perception, but nonetheless, we can still give uh, a wrecker account of seeing aspects. So I'm going to begin then with radical inactivism or REC. <clears throat> now, Wreckers endorse what can be regarded as a substantive uh, notion of representational content. So content is a much used and abused term within the philosophical literature, but Wreckers follow Travis's uh, approach to content. So Travis defines content as there's a way things are according to it, that it represents things as being thus and so, or for all that things need not be that way. And it follows according to Travis uh, that content has what can be called correctness conditions. Uh, as Travis puts it, such correctness is what truth requires. So any such thing 
is truth a valuable? Now, records developed this Travis approach to content in two uh, distinctive ways. So first, they introduced the idea of specification. So according to Eric Mein and Jasper van Herrick, content is what characterizes or specifies something else in a certain way. They also introduced the idea of reflexivity. So X has content about Y when X specifies or characterizes in a way that is reflexive. That is, we can talk about the way in which X characterizes Y. Now, importantly for records, practices themselves don't specify. It is only the things done within a practice that can be specifying. And the analogy here is with, say, a game of chess, how it's only within the game of chess that one player can checkmate another. So case in point here are declarative sentences in natural language. So take a sentence like the sun is setting. This sentence is specific, it specifies or it describes, characterizes, portrays something else. But this sentence is also reflexive because we can talk about how this sentence specifies, how this sentence describes, characterizes, portrays something else. And importantly, this is only possible within a linguistic practice. So it's only the things done within a practice that specify that are reflective and uh, not reflexive, sorry, not the practice itself. Contrast this, for example, with someone, say, absentmindedly doodling on a page. This, this person's action is reflexive. We can talk about the fact that the person is doodling, but their action doesn't also specify because it doesn't specify, it doesn't characterize, it doesn't portray a particular object person or place. After all, it's only a doodle. And in which case, there's no rule then for content. The situation would be very different, however, if that same person were asked to draw, say, an Eames chair. As before, this person's action is reflexive because we can talk about what the person is doing. But unlike before, this the person's action now specifies because it now portrays or characterizes uh, something else. In this case, a particular type of chair. And as such, there now is a rule for content because the person's drawing now can be truth evaluated. So this ends my brief summary of Rex's approach to content. And as should be clear, I'm not defending uh, the radical and active Rex approach to content. I'm simply outlining uh, in broad terms what that approach actually involves. I'm now going to turn to the second part of my talk where I will discuss uh, seeing aspects, aspect perception. So later Wittgenstein is someone well known for his remarks on seeing aspects. And as commentators on Wittgenstein have noted, um, he, while Wittgenstein discusses this topic for many reasons, one of those reasons is to unseat any prior notion that we may have that seeing is a straightforward or simple phenomenon. As Wittgenstein puts it, the concept of seeing makes a tangled impression. Now I'm not going to offer a complete summary of Wittgenstein's remarks on this topic. I'm rather just going to distinguish between optical aspects uh, from, I'm rather going to distinguish optical aspects from conceptual aspects, and I'm going to focus on one of the most well-known examples of conceptual aspects, uh, namely Jastrow's uh, ambiguous duck rabbit picture. So this, as I'm sure most people know, is the picture. It has two aspects. It has a duck aspect and a rabbit aspect. What happens then whenever someone sees one of those aspects? Uh, perhaps they're looking at the picture and then all of a sudden the duck aspect or the rabbit aspect pops or jumps out at them. And they're going to say things like, now I see the picture as a rabbit. Now I see the picture as a duck. So aspects in this case have four distinctive characteristics. They are dynamic, they pop or jump out. They are non-stable. One moment you see the duck aspect, the other moment you see the rabbit aspect. They're exclusive. If you see the rabbit aspect, you can't also simultaneously see the rabbit aspect and vice versa. And crucially, there is a non alienable tie to a ver verbal formulation here. So the verbal formulation is key to seeing the aspects. So seeing the aspects involve, does involve saying, now I see the picture as a duck. Now I see the picture as a rabbit. So to pick on this fourth characteristic, we may wonder, well, what exactly is this tie between uh, seeing aspects and verbal formulation? And a clue here comes from the following remark from Wittgenstein. 
where he wrote, what I perceive in the lighting up of an aspect is not a property of the object, but an internal relation between it and other objects. However, within the literature on Wittgenstein, there's a lot of disagreement as to what exactly an internal relation involves. So for example, Ter Hark states, internal relations are characterized by three features. The relation is between two objects. The relation is not mediated by a third term. The relation exists in the practice, not in the mind or in some abstract medium. Maka agrees with Ter Hark that internal relations are not mediated by a third term and that such relations only exist in the practice. However, he disagrees uh, that such relations only hold between objects. Rather, as Maka puts it, any talk of internal relations between objects has to be understood as talk of internal relations between concepts describing objects. So if we go back to that verbal formulation, now I see the picture as the duck, now I see the picture as a rabbit, and we render it as now I see A as B. Following Maka, this statement involves an internal relation between two concepts describing objects. A, a concept describing one object, and B, another concept describing another object. Crucially, concepts here refer to facts, actions, practices, types of behavior, and in which case that statement, now I see A as B, can be understood as internal relating to actions. A, an action describing one object, and B, another action describing another object. Now, for my purposes, I'm going to assume that Maka is correct in his rendering of, or his understanding of internal relations. And I'm going to try and outline what follows uh, from that. For one thing that follows from that is we can then clarify what is this link, this non alienable tie between seeing aspects and the verbal formulation. What this means is that the statement, now I see A as B, has a particular status within our language game. So this statement is not a description of the perceiver's visual experience, it's not a report of the visual perceiver's visual experience, in which case it's neither true nor false. The statement is instead grammatical. The statement is itself an expression of that experience. So to see aspects is to say, now I see A as B. Now I see the the duck rabbit as a rabbit. Now I see the duck rabbit uh, as a duck. And some textual support for this assessment um, of this statement comes from the following quote from Wittgenstein. Wittgenstein wrote, I look at an animal, someone asks me, what do you see? I answer, a rabbit. I see a landscape, suddenly a rabbit runs past. I exclaim, a rabbit. Both things, both the report and the exclamation are expressions of perception and visual experience but the exclamation is so in a different sense from the report. It is forced from us, stands to the experience somewhat as a cry to pain. So the statement, now I see A as B, is equivalent to the exclamation and not the report. It is forced from us, it stands to the visual experience of seeing aspects as a cry, stands to the experience of pain. And this assessment captures the dynamic, non-stable and exclusive nature of seeing aspects. So this brings me to the end of the second part of my talk. I'm now going to move to the third and final part where I'm going to uh, examine whether or not REC can give uh, an account of seeing aspects, aspect perception. So to rehearse what we said previously, for wreckers, practices make possible actions that have content. Actions that involve content are actions that both specify and are reflexive and so our truth is valuable. And the examples we gave were declarative sentences in natural language, or the drawing of the Eames chair. Now, if we go to that statement, now I see A as B, I previously pointed out that that statement is itself an expression of seeing aspects. This statement is specific. It specifies a particular visual experience, in this case, seeing an aspect. And it is also reflexive. We can talk about how this experience specifies. If REC is correct, then this statement should be true to valuable. But as we saw before, this is not the case because the statement does not describe a perceiver's visual experience and it's not a report on that visual experience. It instead is an expression of that experience. This ensures that REC in fact mischaracterizes seeing aspects. 
Now, I think there are two distinctive ways in which records could respond to this charge of mischaracterization. One is that they could just say that seeing aspects, despite what I've said, is truth of valuable, so there is no mischaracterization. Or second, they could say that seeing aspects does not involve any content, in which case seeing aspects is compatible with REC, since records do not claim that all visual experiences must involve content. However, I think both one and two can be challenged. So to go to the first REC response, it, this REC response could go something like this. So imagine that someone is looking at the duck rabbit, but they fail to see the rabbit aspect. But perhaps someone else can prompt them in such a way that this person can come to see that aspect. So this other person may say, focus on the duck's bill. Could that not instead be seen as a pair of rabbit's ears? And this may, prompting may lead the first person to say, now I see the picture as a rabbit. And in which case, this, it looks like maybe this person's statement is truth of valuable for before they didn't see the rabbit aspect, for it was not true that they saw the rabbit aspect. Now it is true that they see the rabbit aspect. Seeing aspects then is truth of valuable. However, I don't think this works. And the reason, and for, it doesn't work for the following reasons. So first, it's clear that the perceiver must have the ability to describe the objects involved. And it's clear that if the perceiver didn't have these abilities, then no prompting by another person could help them see one of those aspects. So it is correct to say that we can distinguish between what is needed to see the rabbit aspect and the actual seeing of this aspect. But this does not show that the seeing of the aspect is itself truth of valuable. For we, as pointed out earlier, to see the aspect is to say, now I see the picture as a rabbit or now I see the picture as a duck. And this statement is not truth of valuable, as was pointed out before, because it's not a description of the perceiver's visual experience, and it's not a report on that visual experience either. And in which case, this first rec response doesn't work. What then of the second rec response? Well, this second response might go something like this. The person says, now I see the picture as a rabbit. They now are seeing the rabbit aspect. Seeing this aspect is reflexive. We can talk about what this person is seeing. But seeing this aspect is not specific, because if this person is asked to specify what it is about the picture that specifies a rabbit and not a duck, all the perceiver can do is refer back to the picture itself, and the picture itself is deliberately ambiguous. And it is this lack of specificity that ensures that seeing the rabbit or duck aspect is non-contentful, in which case there's no, con there's no conflict between rec and aspect perception. However, as with the first REC response, I don't think the second REC response works either. As pointed out before, in the second part of my talk, aspects are exclusive. So to see one aspect is not to see the another aspect. To see the rabbit aspect is to not see the duck aspect. In which case the statement, now I see the, duck, the, the picture as a rabbit, or now I see the picture as a duck, is specific. It specifies that the perceiver is seeing one of those aspects and not simultaneously seeing the other aspects. Uh, nonetheless, I think this second response by REC does get at something very important. And that important thing is that seeing aspects is indeed non-contentful. And this is a point I'm going to try and develop uh, in the following slides. Before I do that, just to rehearse where we are, I have argued that REC does mischaracterize seeing aspects. I examined the two objections to that and I showed ne how neither objection works. If that's correct, then seeing aspects is a visual experience that is specific and reflexive, but it is not truth or valuable. What I want to then ask is, well, then could we still nonetheless still give a REC account of seeing aspects? And I think we can. So here is my tentative proposal. Seeing aspects is a non-contentful visual experience, but this visual experience is embedded within linguistic practices. So seeing aspects involves internally relating actions to describe objects. Actions to describe objects are only possible within linguistic practices. And these actions are themselves contentful. So these actions specify and they're specific, they're reflexive, we can talk about how they specify and their truth are valuable. And in which case, contentful actions provide the embedding needed for non-contentful seeing of aspects. 
Now, an initial objection to this proposal might be that it simply introduces another interface problem. As anyone familiar with the literature on radical and activism rec will know, the original interface problem was between basic minds and non-basic minds. The objection now would be that there is a new interface problem, this time between linguistic practices that involve contentful actions and non-contentful visual experiences. However, I don't think there is uh, any such problem. So the statement I see A as B, now I see A as B, in turn relates to actions. The statement is an expression of the visual experience of seeing aspects. Well, it's plausible to say that this statement is itself also an action. And if the statement can be regarded as an action, then there is no difference in kind between contentful actions on the one hand and non-contentful seeing of aspects, since both are actions. And if there is no difference in kind uh, here, then there arguably also is no interface problem. Some actions embed other actions. So to conclude, I have argued that REC does mischaracterize aspect perception. Nonetheless, we can still give a REC account of seeing aspects. This is because if we understand seeing aspects as a non-contentful visual experience embedded within linguistic practices, then this turns out to be compatible uh, with radical anachronism or REC. Thank you for listening.